Um, well, I got in by pure and utter accident. It was it was a sequence of events that happened, which which I, you know I, it was pure and utter fate. In that I was running this small company, importing and exporting baked beans to the Middle East. It sounds bizarre, but that's what the company was scraping a living. I'm very you know I had to eat more of the stock than I actually kept. And this company was called Taurus. And then there was a phone call. Um, after this company had been up and running for about six months, there was a phone call from this company called Commodore, and they made the machine called the Amiga. And they said, oh, we've heard about your company, and we'd really love you to um, kind of develop some stuff for us. And uh, I was intrigued by this, and so I went up to see them, and they were talking about this product that they were making, and they, they were making this thing called the Amiga, and it sounded fantastic. And they allowed me to have five new Amigas. And so these Amigas arrived. I didn't know what to do with them. So I would have always had a passion for games. And so I um, started fiddling around on it. And from that came my first game, which was called Populous. Um, which was, you know, this mad, crazy idea about why not be a god and you can raise and lower land. That I thought no one would like. And as it turned out, when the game was released... Um, it was a huge worldwide success. No one was more surprised than me. And that was kind of what it was like in the 1980s and 90s. It was very, it was much more seat of the pants than it is today. You know, you could be a single person and you could have an idea and, you know, it could be released and be a worldwide success. Actually, the interesting thing now, we're in, 2000, in the 2000s and you've got mobile phones coming around and Facebook, feels a lot more like it was in, in, in the old 80s and 90s days. Well, the development of the original populace was done on a diet of pizzas and uh, full-strength Coca-Cola and cigarettes. Um, it was me and a friend in a tiny little, um, a tiny little office over the, above uh, this old woman called Kath, who let us have the room for free. And we, um, we just worked all hours at Godsend, uh, you know, seven days a week, not because we had to, but because we really enjoyed it, or we smoked and we drank and we played the game incessantly. And that was the real key, um, not only to Populous, but all the games that I've done, I think, that have been the most successful ones are the ones that we've played the most. We played every single day, over and over again, and just played and polished and played and polished and played and polished. You, you know, Populous in a way was like a great piece of modern art where an artist has accidentally thrown a pot of paint against the canvas and, oh my God, that's a brilliant piece of work. It felt like more of an accident. We didn't start out and think, right, we're going to do this God game, we're going to do Raising and Lowering Land, there's lots of little people. It started very simply. It started with this, just this green landscape. And then I was playing around and thinking, God, what could you do on this green landscape? And I thought, well, I put little people on the green landscape. Oh, that looks very nice. And then, interestingly, I tried to get these little people to move around, you know, naturally, to explore the little landscape. So I thought it would be lovely to, to, to kind of imbue life to these little people. And I remembered when I was a kid looking at ants' nests and how wonderful it was to think there was life there. And these people, little people used to move around. But then when they used to hit the, the coastline, they they would just walk across the water and that would look stupid and ridiculous. And I just wasn't a good enough programmer to work out how to make them kind of navigate around this m little maze of, of coastline. So I thought, you know, I can't program this. I'm not, not smart enough. I know what I'll do is I'll just get the player to raise the land for these little people. They'll just stand by the coast and if they, the player wants to little person to move out onto the water, they have to raise the land. And that was how it, the whole mechanic was born. It was really born out of my total incompetence as a programmer, rather than born out of any... There was no design documents, there was no art style. It was just, it was just ah, let's try this out. Oh, that works. Let's try this out. That works. Let's try this out. This, that doesn't work. I've always been a little bit critical about the games I've done because they feel like a poor example of what they should have been inside my mind. Now, that's not to say that the people I've worked with haven't been totally brilliant. They have been. It's just me as a kind of games director, you know, why didn't I make that point clear and that point not? And with Populous, I always thought, and it was a total mistake, it took me 10 years to realise this mistake. I always thought, gosh, you know, wouldn't it be great to give 
you know, the players more power, more earthquakes, more, you know, firestorms. I know I could have forests, and this is ridiculous in Populous 2, I did this. I'll have a forest that grows. It'll obey all the rules of this um, little game called Life. And, oh no, I spent hours programming this. That was all rubbish. Really, what I should have done is just made the very simple thing in the game even better. And the simple thing that people really loved was raising and lowering the land. And instead of thinking about ways I could make that even more wonderful, make it feel even more godly, I instead focused on these growing trees and focused on big tornadoes. And But people would have loved those simple mechanics. Just imagine a populace where you could grow the land and the land seem even more alive. It would be fantastic and tremendous. And it took me 10 years to realize that. And a, a sequel which should have been much, much better than it actually was. Well, Dungeon Keeper started with me watching a James Bond movie called You Only Live Twice. Uh, and in that, James Bond completely unfairly found the evil, I think his name was Scaramanga or someone, I can't remember the name of the baddie, in this hollowed out volcano, went in there, and at the touch of one button, it seemed to me, destroyed the whole of the space. That's completely unfair. This poor evil dude had spent his whole life building... I mean, to build your evil base in an extinct volcano, you've got to give him 10 out of 10 of innovation. And it just didn't... I wanted to know his story, not James Bond's story. He just flew in there, pressed the button, and flew out with a, with a pretty girl. And that gave me... I remember thinking about that after seeing that movie and thinking, God, I would love to have a story or a game about being a bad guy. What's it like to be a bad guy? And that's how dungeon, the idea of Dungeon Keeper was born. Imagine you had a dungeon, and these heroes keep coming in and trying to steal your treasure. You know, what could you do? And that's how we, you know, the idea was born. And then the mechanics of the idea was, were twofold. Firstly, how wonderful it would feel just to be able to sort of make your own dungeon. Rather than draw it out on some CAD package, just have these little imps who could chip away the, the stone and, you know, literally build your own dungeon and then have these heroes come in. And that's really how the idea, how, how the idea came about. And um, again, you know, there was multiplayer in there and we played a lot of multiplayer and, you know, it was one of those, one of those games which was a joy to develop, really was. So Dungeon Keeper was the first real game where I started to explore about this morality choice. And you playing the game as a bad guy and realising that you had to, to recruit things, you had to torture them, and you had to be just generally really mean, was really interesting because what I've, what I found is when you actually try to say that to people, you know, this is a game where you would torture people and you say be successful, everyone would go, oh, that's terrible, I've never played that. But as soon as you sit people down in front of the game, they start playing, they forget their morals entirely. They forget about, you know, you know, uh, torturing stuff. And I found that absolutely fascinating. And then I, re I think I realised at the end of the development of, of Dungeon Keeper, what if we made a game where choice was at the centre of the game, where you could get to the end successfully by being ultimately evil or wonderfully good. That would be really unique. That wouldn't be like playing the role of some precant hero. It would be you, a reflection of you. And how fascinating would it be to get to an end of a game and say, gosh, I really didn't realise I'd be that sort of person. We started on Fable, and we, start, we started talking about why don't we do a role-playing game. I mean, I love role-playing games. I love the idea of being a character in a world. But a lot of the role-playing games were incredibly techy, and they were all about numbers and stats and, you know, 250 abilities, and it didn't matter what you did in the world, everybody had the same opinion of you. And I thought at the time, wouldn't it be fascinating... Firstly, to create a game which was a lot more accessible, because the idea of playing the role of something should appeal to a huge audience. So to make it super accessible, let's not make it super techy. And the next thing is, imagine playing in a world where people notice the things that you did. You, you could be 
an evil character, and people would run away from you because they'd be scared. It'd be like, I remember seeing westerns and when, you know, that when the, the evil cowboy came in, everybody shut their doors and ran away. That was real inspiration for that. Or you could be the good character and everyone were overly sy sycophantic to you. If you played a game in that way, and if the world noticed what you did and remembered what you did, how would it make you feel as a player? Well, I think it would make you feel so much better because at that time, there were a lot of the games had these can characters used to stand on the edge side of the street you used to be able to do the unspeakable things in front of them they used to just stand there and look at you and that always aggravated me so fable was this blend of why don't we have a simulated world why don't we have a simulated world which reacts to what you do why don't we have a story which is allows you to be good or evil so moral choices in there but why and why don't we make it accessible enough that lots of people can play the most interesting thing is when you give moral choice. My original thought is that a lot of people would love to play around with the darker side because, you know, life, you'll feel so constrained, you know, by the rules. You know, games should allow you to break those rules. Uh, but the fascinating, slightly disappointing thing is that the vast majority of people will play good. So then the next challenge is, if everyone's going to play good, how can you really push them and test them in that? And so with um, the last game I did, Fable 3, the first choice that you get is a really tough choice. It's not a good evil choice, it's just a choice. Do you save your girlfriend or do you save these group of strangers? And that's what I found that, people found that a very interesting choice. So royalty walks into our home, a princess no less. You're a long mile from the castle, princess. What do you think of our home then? Do you like what your brother has done to us? And it's all about the quality and it's all about looking at the things and saying, right, that's the important thing about this game. It's coming, going back to the idea of what was important about populace. It was a raising and lowing land, just like in Fable. You know, the Fable has got, you know, hundreds of features. You can do jobs and you pub games and you can, you can use spells and you can use guns. You know, there's a, there's a huge wide variety of features. And as it gets tougher and tougher to make these games, what we have to do is we have to realise that we're going to have to narrow that, otherwise it's going to, you know, we're going to have need insanely big teams. And in narrowing that and looking at what is the real key important thing that people will enjoy, that's the first, that's the first thing, way of looking at it, as if you're going to go from one to two to three to four to five to six to seven. But there's another way of looking at it, isn't there? Is that, for me, and maybe it's just me, it's not only the execution of the, the of the entertainment I see. It's the uniqueness and the originality. It's the it's that turning the corner and thinking, my God, I can't believe there's this in the game. And I love that. And I think you have to say this in each of the successive successive episodes that we release, is we have to surprise the player. And if the surprising the player means us being brave and bold and different and if surprising the player and creating a sense of wonder means taking risks, we have to take those, those risks. It's a very interesting point, is that in a way the most agile of all production processes was when I worked on my own. Because, you know, every, you know, every, I could, I was in control of absolutely everything, absolutely, I could decide where to focus my attention. And over the years, we've tried lots of different methodologies in a way to return to that most efficient way of being a single, a single cog in the wheel, in a machine. Um, we have tried sitting in rooms, trying to think through every single problem, writing vast tomes of documentation, rolling that out to the team, sitting back and relaxing and saying, ah, oh, in six months' time we'll be playing a brilliant game. It doesn't work. The terrible thing about that is you can be in a room and you can think through all these wonderful ideas, but you lose everything when you translate that onto a piece of paper. So that way of doing things we've moved away from. Another way of, of, that we've tried is actually laying things out very serially. And so it's almost like a gameplay script, right? And one minute into the game, this is going to happen. A five minutes game, this is going to happen five hours and again this is going to happen. The trouble with that process is that whilst that all works perfectly well and you look at this and say, you know, gosh, this is going to be a brilliant game, four hours, I'm going to, you know, meet this baddie and it'd be great. 
if anything changes up here, the whole flow then has to, you have to produce another one, so that doesn't work. Our latest w approach is um, something called agile development, and that is to have one person like myself pretty much be the only person with the whole vision in their head and then these little groups of people just work on one or two week sprint so you'll go to them and say right try this mechanic this you know try and develop this mechanic. do the best thing you can about it. how's the mechanic feel feels pretty good and then the first thing that you try and do as quickly as possible is get something which you play and then you play and play and play and then you add things to that that sort of thread which you're playing through. So you don't write anything. One of the rules of this is to write very little down but to execute it. But we've you know, changed this process myriad of times in the, in the development of games. You have this problem where a certain amount of your time is allocated to, to actually the crafting and you know, getting everything in. And and then what you, your theory is, oh, OK, we'll spend half the time getting all the stuff in, and then half the time balancing it, refining it, and pacing it, and editing it, and, you know, just like a lovely bonsai tree, just, you know, training it, and putting this beautiful thing at the end. And what ends up happening a lot of times in development terms, it takes so long to craft this stuff, it starts eating into that polish time. Oh, well, you know... OK, we won't have six months of polish, but we, we you know, won't need more than four months. And then that four months will be three, two, and in the end you can be talking about days of which polishing. And that's where the real disasters happen, because whenever you do any, you bring, you know, it's just like a recipe. If you just chuck all the ingredients in a pot, stir it around and serve it up, it's probably not going to taste very nice. But if you, you know, add an ingredient and taste it and mm, a seasoning started out, that's, a, that's the most simplest thing in the world, you know, just, you know, cooking a soup. You know, it's, it's a million times more complex, obviously, making a game. I love being inspired by everything, by life, by, you know, films and books and, and TV programs and my son and my wife and but not so much by the images that are passing in front of my eyes, more about the feelings that are instilled inside me. And, you know, I've always had this really um, interesting... I've always been fascinated by morals, about what, what is good and what is evil and what's right and what's wrong and how some societies can view one thing as being perfectly OK and others can view other things as not OK. And giving people the power to do what they want to do inside a game I've been absolutely fascinated with and you can see that in the thread of a lot of games I've done in fact pretty much for all the games there's always a slight darker edge even you know one of the most cutest game I've ever done is a game called theme park even in that you could build these unbelievably high roller coasters that would make everyone feel sick when they came off the ride so there's always that that slight twist in there because I'm always you know, when I'm watching a film or, or you're just experiencing life, I'm always wondering in my mind, well, you know, what if the bad guy won? What if, you know, the good guy missed, missed the train? And, you know, that's a fascinating side of, of, of um, life, which I try and bring into the games that I've worked on. You know, I try and avoid the saccharine sweet side of storytelling and, and gameplay, which can so often infect a game. And, I think that's what English is, is, is about. It's about, you know, making people laugh or making people fascinated with a kind of ethos or a, or a, 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 a sort of legendary system which is kind of built up in people's minds around the world, which I love to kind of amplify in, in something like Fable. And then I, you know, I remember this is a classic example of what I think of is as Englishness in, a, in a, a game I did called Black and White. We were, you know, playing around with the game, and there were these little villages, and we made we put one little person in that village, who could not die. It doesn't matter what you did to the person; you could stamp on him, you could set him alight, you could throw him in the sea, and he would just come back and say, "Well, oh, that hurt, but you know, I'm sure I'll be all right." That was very English. It just felt like that was the right English thing to do. I mean, you were being unspeakably cruel to this person, but the very fact that 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 was there, it felt like an English this this about it and I think there is that about the English con about the English um, game development style and the general entertainment style is that we tend to go slightly off the, the beaten path we tend to try you know and experiment with things which other people may be too scared to experiment with 
I got this bizarre thing where I go into a shop and I buy the game that I've just made and go home and play it. And a lot of time when I play it, you know, really for the first time, because every other time before release, it's, you do these playthroughs again and again and again, but you're always writing a list. So when you sit down and finally play it as a, you know, an end user, I end up thinking, my God, I can't believe that I suggested that, or why didn't I hang on to that idea? Well, you know, why didn't we, we, we keep that idea? And you know, the game I've just recently finished called Fable Three is a great example of that. Is that the game, when it was first laid out in concept, was um, half of the game was supposed to be about being an adventurer, and the other half of the game was supposed to be about being a becoming a king and what it's like to rule people and to to command people. And unfortunately, we had to shrink down that portion so much. So I ended up playing that game and, you know, almost cringing behind the sofa for, for a good hour afterwards, thinking, oh, you know, I really regret those decisions. So it's always a mixture of pride and regret and fear and unbelievable joy. To imagine any work of mine in a museum or in a gallery space is, is, is unbelievable. I mean, you have to remember that I, that a lot of me comes from the, the idea, the concept that, you know, I could never be good enough to make anything, let alone have work shown off in a museum. So that is an incredible feeling. It scares me as well. You know, seeing your work lined up like that is a, is a way of almost saying to yourself, my God, I, again, I, w I wish I hadn't taken that approach with this one and that approach with this one but I hope that seeing all of this together in some ways it shows that innovation and kind of you know doing something which doesn't seem necessarily sensible at the time isn't part of that isn't part of a formula can work because I've always believed that and I've always railed against the idea of a publisher coming to me and saying Oh, you know, wouldn't it be great if you did, you know, that? The game designers' documents were a requirement of publishers to, for you to get paid. You used to have this very defined thing. You used to sign your deal, you got some money. Right, next time you get some money is when you give us the design document. Now, I can remember doing design documents back in the... I mean, they used to be utter and completely made up rubbish. You know, because you knew that this big... As long as long, you used to get a ruler and... If it was an inch thick, you know, that's worth that's enough money. Oh, my God, we're, we've got this three quarters of an inch. We need another three quarters. Someone could write, you know, some rubbish and just pack it out. That's the way you, that we used to think about it. I remember when my first game, Populous, the publisher came, when we were showing Populous around, trying to get it signed up, couldn't get it signed up, um, publishers would say, well, can you give these little people guns and could they be fighting against each other? And I... I've always railed against that. I've always sort of thought, well, you know, how can we be unique and original? It's going to be amazing to see that space. And I hope if anybody, you know, sees it, I hope they realise that, you know, you can be innovational and you can, you know, be brave with some of your concepts and it can, it can work.